Well, Cedar Street Baptist Church and for all our visitors and friends tuning in, good morning. We are so grateful that you joined us once again as we conclude a, a journey together. For the last few weeks, we've been looking at uh, the book of Philippians chapter 3 in a sermon series entitled Refocus. Refocus. And, we, and I mentioned throughout this series that Paul is writing a letter to this church at Philippi as a very concerned shepherd for his sheep. And he wanted to encourage them during a time of great tribulation. Well, as Paul wanted to do for the church at Philippi, so I, as your pastor and friend, want to do for you today as well. And that is encourage you during a very crazy and uncertain time. And I want to encourage you with good news from God's Word on what we can refocus on to bring us joy in a time where everything is changing and trying to give us reasons not to have joy. And so, so far in the series, we have looked at uh, Philippians chapter 3, starting in verses 1 through 11, the beginning of our series, we talked about refocusing on our real identity, that we have to lose what we have to find out whose we are in Christ, that Jesus is our foundation, our identity is found in being with Him and being redeemed by Him. And in our second week, we looked at verses 12 through 16, talking about refocusing on your real calling. And so if our new foundation is Christ, our calling is onward and upward. We don't look back, but we look forward. And we don't look down here, but we look up there to see what, what it is that we're really supposed to be doing in preparation for our eternity with Christ. And then last week, we looked at verses 17 through 20, and we talked about refocusing on our real home. And we said that our real home is eternal. And that what we, hear, what we have here on earth is wonderful, but it is temporary. And therefore, we need to keep our eyes on our real home so that we can be the most effective in our temporary place uh, on the way home. And so that leads us to the conclusion of our series as we once again look at verse 20, but we conclude with verse 21. The title of our message here this morning is Refocus on Your Real Reward. Refocus on your real reward. We're going to take a look at the treasure of our true reward of living a resurrected eternity because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And I want to begin by, by stating something that maybe some of you are not aware of and maybe you have felt guilt over, but you shouldn't. Here's what I want to say. I believe that every single human being has a question that you ask yourself multiple times a day and you even ask yourself this question on a subconscious level before you logged in to listen to this message. And that question is this, what's in it for me? What is in it for me? Meaning there is a reward for what I am about to do. What's that reward and why should I do this? You see, here's something that's intrinsically true of every human being in every moment of their existence. Everything we do is seeking a reward. You can't, you can't avoid that, all right? Human beings are hardwired to avoid pain and pursue pleasure. This happens from the moment the baby comes out of the womb and it happens until the moment we go in the tomb. All right, we're, we're avoiding pain, we're seeking pleasure, we want to be fed, we want to be clothed, we want to be comforted. And there's nothing wrong with that, we're hardwired for that. This morning or whenever you're logging on to this message, you're logging in because you want a reward. Somehow, some way, you're seeking to be blessed by logging in. Uh, and again, it could be for many different reasons. Some of you are just looking for a distraction. Uh, I know that I am a procrastinator by nature, so I'll log into videos on YouTube because I want the instantaneous gratification of being entertained instead of having to do the, the work that's laid before me. So that's my struggle sometimes, but that's still a reward. Some of you are logging on because you legitimately want to learn the Word of God and, and you want to grow in your understanding of God so that you can be rewarded by the blessings of God. Whatever the case may be, there's nothing that you do on this planet that is not somehow seeking a reward. So I want to say that we don't have the wrong desire when we desire to be rewarded. No, the problem that we have is that the rewards that we seek are not the rewards that God wants us to be seeking. A lot of times we are seeking after shallow things, after uh, insignificant things, petty things. And I think God is saying, no, I, I, I want to reward you but I want you to be seeking after what is true, 
what is eternal, what is real. Hence the title of our message, refocusing on our real reward. And we're going to be talking about the rewards that are given to us through the resurrection, okay? The, the power of Christ and the work of Christ and the rewards that he gives us by grace through faith in his finished works. And so that leads us to our big idea, and here it is in one sentence. Refocus on your real reward of a resurrected eternity in the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ. Refocus on your real reward of a resurrected eternity in the kingdom of God with Jesus Christ. I really believe that if we can refocus on the rewards of resurrection, uh, we can enjoy the things of the world but we won't try to seek the great rewards out of them because of the great reward that we have ahead of us in Christ. And so if you want to know about the rewards of resurrection, if you want to know about this eternity in the kingdom of God and how we can refocus on this now to have joy here in anticipation of what's there, would you join me by turning to the book of Philippians? Again, we're in chapter 3. We're going to be reading two verses. I'm going to start in verse 20 for context. We preached a lot on verse 20 last week. But then we're going to connect it to verse 21, the focal point of our message here this morning. Again, we're in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 20 and concluding the chapter in verse 21. Hear God's word to us in his inerrant, infallible, fully sufficient word through the Apostle Paul to us. It says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now here's verse 21. Who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. Let's pray. Lord, today and throughout this series, I confess to you that without the power of the Holy Spirit, We cannot take our eyes off the things of the world and put them on the things that are eternal, but in the power of the Spirit we can, and so I pray for the power of your Spirit to be among us, for me as I preach, for everyone listening as they tune in and and focus on what you're telling us here in your word in Philippians chapter 3 through your servant, the Apostle Paul. Lord, help us. Help us to see our real reward and let it be a great motivation for how we live these final days here on earth. Let this be a joy. Let this be an encouragement. Whatever we're dealing with today, Lord, let this just be a wonderful time, a respite, where we celebrate what lies ahead and let it change how it is that we live here. And all these things we ask, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So again, Paul has been building up to this in in Philippians 3. He begins the chapter in verses 1 through 11 talking about that identity in Christ. I count everything as lost for their surpassing joy of knowing Christ. And then he talked about that calling, that forgetting what lies behind, I I strain forward to what lies ahead for the upward call. And then we talked about home. Last week we said in verse 20 that our true citizenship is in heaven. So Paul's been building this portrait. Here's your new identity in Christ. Here's your new calling that's upward. Here's your new home that's heavenward. But the portrait is not complete until we consider this real reward that comes by knowing this identity and fulfilling this calling and going to this home. And that portrait, again, is this real reward of resurrection eternity. Resurrection eternity. And so I think we need to have a resurrected view of this resurrected eternity. And, well, I hope to do that in the next few moments by sharing with you, I think, three glorious aspects of our reward of a resurrected eternity. And so the first of those three glorious aspects is this. Number one, your real reward is a resurrected eternity in a glorified body. In a glorified body. Again, if you look at verse 21, it says that Christ will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. So here's the reality of our salvation. 
Our salvation is something that begins inward and works its way outward, okay? That's what salvation is all about, all right? In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 16, Paul says, So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. Here's what that means. Your body is decaying. That's not great news, but it's true. Your teeth are getting more yellow. Your skin is getting more wrinkled. Your hair is getting more thin if you have any snow left on the mountaintop. All right, that's what's happening right now. The outer self is wasting away. But guess what's happening to the inner self if you're a Christian? It's being renewed. All right, your soul is being strengthened if you're a Christian and following Christ. Your faith is being strengthened. Your purpose is being strengthened. Your joy should be magnifying if... You are growing in maturity in Christ. You're following the Lord and you're seeking heavenly rewards. All right, so that's salvation. It's inward and it's working its way outward. Now, you may stop there and say, well, the outward is wasting away. How is it working outward if our body is decaying and one day it's going to go in the grave? Here's the good news. All right, in verse 21, again, he says that he's going to transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body. What does that mean? It means that you actually will get a new physical body. All right, and, and I'm going to hopefully clarify some misunderstandings about what heaven is all about because no one has that new body yet except Christ, but we're going to get a new body because of Christ. All right, so... How do I know this? In addition to verse 21, Paul says it again, and he says it in greater depth in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 5. I want you to listen closely, okay? Listen to what Paul's saying about this promise of a new body. He says, for we know that if the tent, meaning the physical body here on earth, that is our earthly home is destroyed, our physical body is going to die and we're going to go into a grave. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, in this physical body, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. So that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared for us this very thing is God who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So he's saying we groan because of this body. It hurts. It gets weary. It wrinkles. It decays. It will die and go into a grave. And we don't groan just to get out of this body. I'll talk in a few minutes about how that's a deception of Greek philosophy. No, we groan to be more fully clothed. We groan to have a new body that will not grow weary. A new body that we will enjoy for all of eternity. That is what we long for. And that is what verse 21 is promising us. And I believe that we need to meditate on the wonderful characteristics of the resurrected body. Let me just share a few. In your new resurrected body at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what type of body you're going to have? It's a body that will have no more capability of sin. We will not accidentally or intentionally grieve the heart of God again. Your new body will have no more limitations. You will not have any more conflict between your will and your ability to carry out that will. Our whole lives, we've tried to put our mind to something and realize that we have physical limits. We can't always do what we want to do. We'll have no more aches and pains. We will not wake up with any more unwanted surprises of a body that, that, that moans and creaks like the hardwood floor that we stand on in the morning. All right, we'll have no more disease, no more medication, no more need to quarantine or social distance. All right, we'll have no more wrinkles. Women, we won't have any more need for makeup. We won't have any more need for plastic surgery, any more need to try to pretty up this decaying body to pretend like we're not uh, fading away when we are. And then, obviously, no more death. No more grieving or fear of separation. This is the glorious promise of a new body. And this is a reward that we will receive by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. 
upon his second coming. Now, why is it that we don't think about this a lot? Well, the answer to that is Greek philosophy and specifically a man named Plato. Okay, Plato taught a Platonic view that the body was inherently evil. All right, and sometimes the Bible can, can uh, if we don't fully understand what the Bible teaches, we can fall into this trap of saying in the flesh, all right, by meaning that all flesh, physical body is evil. No, in the flesh means the human nature of sin. It doesn't mean that our physical bodies by themselves are evil. All right, and so what Plato would teach is the way to salvation is to shed your physical body, let your spirit be free, and then you will not have to deal with the realm of sin anymore. But that's not what the scriptures teach. Your physical body is not evil by itself. No, it has been tainted by sin, just like your soul has. But God has created us in two ways. To be fully human is to be fully physical and to be fully spiritual. And when we die, Paul said to be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And that is a glorious truth, but it's an incomplete truth. All right, so here's what I want to say. There is what we call a present heaven. And I think it is good and right to call that present heaven a place of paradise. And as we said last week, heaven is home. However, that home is still a temporary home that is not permanent yet. So, and here's the reason why. To be absent with the body is to be present with the Lord. And when we go to be with the Lord in his spiritual presence, even though that's paradise, it's a place without sin, without death, without separation. We are with loved ones who've gone on to be with the Lord. We are in the presence of God. We are in a heavenly realm that cannot be uh, tainted in any way by sin. As great as that is, and as much paradise as our loved ones who've gone on before us, as much paradise as they're enjoying right now, they also are longing for the return of Christ here on earth because with it will come the promise of a new body. And they, as well as us, if we have our faith in Christ, will receive a new body and we will once again be fully human as God intended. We will be physical and we will be spiritual. And so... I just, I want to pause here for a second, and I, before we move on to point two, I just want to ask, does the reward of a new body help you to endure the current body that you have? Perhaps you've never found encouragement in this because you've never thought about getting a new body. You thought, I go to heaven, that's where I'm going to be, I'll be a spirit, I'll float around with other spirits, and that's just the way it's going to be for all of eternity, and it'll be fine. No. That's great. And that's, I guess, phase one of the eternal plan, but it's incomplete. I want you to stop and think about this. For all the things that we said that we don't have, that we will have, okay? We have a body of sin. We have a body of limitations. We have a body of aches and pains and disease and wrinkles and death. In the midst of experiencing all those things, can you be encouraged today? Will you be encouraged today? that God is going to do away with all that and you're going to get to experience once again the joys of a physical body at its peak. In fact, I think of Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, a verse most of us know quite well. The prophet says, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. That's the promise of a new body on a new, a new planet, which we're going to talk about in a second. So number one, your real reward is a resurrected eternity in a glorified body. That moves us on to number two. Your real reward is a resurrected eternity on a glorified earth. On a glorified earth. All right, so we're going to get a new body, but we got to live somewhere with this new body. And right now, the heavenly realm is a spiritual realm. Now, make no mistake about it. I do believe that those in heaven right now can identify one another because in some way they have a spiritual body. They have spiritual clothing of some kind. Again, I can't tell you what it is because I haven't been there, but I do believe that we'll recognize one another up there. But those that are up there are going to come down here upon the return of Christ and live on a new earth with that new body. You say, well, I hadn't heard a lot about this. Well, if you haven't, it's because you haven't read the book of Revelation. All right, because Revelation clearly teaches that 
The present heaven is temporary paradise and it leads to eternal glory and God's word promises a new heavens and new earth. Revelation uh, chapter 21 verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. All right, so there's a present heaven. That's where all the loved ones that we have that love Christ and know Christ have gone on to be with Him. That's where they are. If you and I die before Christ returns, that's where we're headed. And it's glorious. And it's paradise. And it's home. But it's not our eternal home. No, our eternal home is a new body and it's on a new earth because it also says the first heaven and the first earth will pass away. Upon the return of Christ, he's going to bring heaven down. We will have, quote unquote, heaven on earth. You've heard that expression? Well, that's going to be a reality according to Revelation. He's going to bring heaven down here. What's here on earth is going to burn up in some majestic way and heaven and earth will collide and what we will have is a beautiful resurrected eternity on a physical planet. And this is what Christ has been promising us. I want you to listen to another passage just a few verses later in Revelation 21, verse 5. Here's what Jesus says. It says, And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this thing down for these words are trustworthy and true. Jesus said, I'm making all things new. All right, that is not just redemption. That's not just saving us out of hell. No, that's restoration. That's taking what he already created and restoring it to what it was supposed to be. That's God's plan of salvation. All right, and he's, where's, what's he restoring? He's restoring what the world was supposed to be like without sin. And so what do we know about that? Well, we can go back to the Garden of Eden in Genesis and we can see that God created this beautiful place where he dwelled with his people and he told them to be fruitful and multiply and that that little garden would eventually encapsulate the, all four corners of the earth as they obeyed and multiplied. That garden would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And the kingdom of God would be over all four corners of the earth. All right, and the kingdom of God, I've used this uh, quite a few times. I think it's so helpful. Graham's Goldsworthy, an Australian uh, theologian, said that there's four ways that we can look at the kingdom of God. And perhaps you've heard me say this a few times. He says the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place, under God's rule, and receiving God's blessing. Now think about the Garden of Eden. All right, God's people, Adam and Eve, were in God's place, the Garden of Eden. They were under God's rule. They were told to do some things and not to do other things. And they were receiving God's blessing. God provided everything they needed. However, they rejected God's rule by eating for the uh, forbidden fruit from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because they rejected his rule, they forfeited his blessing and they were kicked out of his place. Stop and think about that. All right, but Jesus Christ, as it was promised in Genesis 3.15, is a seed of the woman to come to crush the head of Satan and defeat sin, hell, and the grave. And by doing that, he's restoring the kingdom. He's restoring God's people. That's every tribe, tongue, and nation who has received Christ. He is restoring God's place, God's relational presence as he dwells among his people on a physical earth. He's restoring God's rule. Christ will sit on the throne and rule in his eternal kingdom. And he's, re he's restoring God's blessing. Those who live on this earth, when it's resurrected, will receive innumerable blessing. That's the promise of resurrection. Jesus is saying, I have come to make all things new. All things new. And so stop for a second and say this. If you knew this was the reward of a new earth, how would it help you in your life on this current earth? Now, let me stop and say that we're called to be stewards, which means that God has given us earthly resources right now and we should steward them well. All right, we should seek to take care of the current earth, even if it's temporary, okay? It, you know, we are called to be good stewards of the resources that God has given to us. So it's not that we turn a blind eye. It's not. But it's we keep in perspective that the best is yet to come and that even though this earth is not what we want it to be, it's just a foretaste of what's coming. And so 
I think that meditating on the new heavens and new earth, it helps us not to obsess on the issues of the current earth. And also it helps us not to obsess over the current experiences of the current earth. Now here's what I mean by that. Perhaps you have a bucket list. Okay, I'm not saying these are wrong. But you say, you know, when I die, I'm not going to be able to experience skydiving and I'm not going to be able to experience vacations to Europe and I got to see these places. I got to experience these things. I only got one life to do it. I got to get it all done now because I can't do it later. Well, here's what the Bible teaches. You're going to get a chance to do all these things forever. You have plenty of time in eternity to visit Europe. You have plenty of time in eternity to go skydiving. You have plenty of time in eternity to go on a hot air balloon ride or whatever your heart desires. So I'm not saying that we don't do any of those things now, but what, I, what I'm saying is we don't obsess over those things. We don't lay in bed with regret that we couldn't go here or do this. No, we got all of eternity to do that stuff. But there are things that we can do now that we can't do in eternity. We can't witness to other people. We can't store up treasures and get rewards for the, the, the life of faith that we live down here. No, we have to do those things now because our eternity, our rewards of eternity depend on how faithful we are with what he stewarded us with down here. So we can enjoy the earth. We can celebrate that it's a taste of what's to come, but we must not obsess on this current earth because it will pass away. But we will receive not only a new body, but a new earth to, to live out with that new body. And that's a glorious treasure. So number two, your real reward is a resurrected eternity in a glorified body on a glorified earth. And then number three, it will be with a glorified Savior. It will be with a glorified Savior. Oh, the, the verse starts in verse 21 with, we await a Savior. We await a Savior. We await a person. And I've said throughout the series that uh, we can seek after all these things, but at the end of the day, if you want to boil it down, the greatest reward that we have is Christ. The greatest reward that we have is, is Christ himself, and he'll reign over his kingdom, and we will be so glad to submit to his lordship. I want you to listen to Revelation 22, verses 3 through 4. It says, No longer will there be anything accursed, but the throne of God and the Lamb will be in it, and his servants will worship him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. The greatest reward that you will ever have is you will see the face of the risen Christ, and you will bow at his feet. You will worship him every hour for all of eternity and it will overflow your heart with such joy that there are no human words to encapsulate what it's going to be like. That's the eternity that awaits you if you are a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. And here's the deal. We live here on earth and we live under the, the rule of human leaders. All right, Human leadership is flawed. Human leadership is limited, all right? Human leaders cannot promise you the things that they promise you. Trust me, there is no human leader that can fully give you what they're telling you they will give you before the election is complete. And why? They're human. And we put so much faith in human leadership, it's unreal. But Christ, Christ will reign in perfection. He will reign in perfection. It will be a joy to submit to his lordship. It will be a joy. I love these words from Job. In the book of Job, chapter 19, verses 25 through 27, Job says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth, and after my skin has thus been destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Job didn't quite fully understand. Of course, we've had more revelation since the book of Job. God has divinely inspired these books to give us a clearer and clearer vision in the scriptures of what lies ahead. But he knew, he knew that his Redeemer would live and that he'd be on a physical earth in, a, in somehow a different body and he would see his Redeemer rule and reign forever. That is the Lord Jesus Christ. And if, if Job knew that, we know more than Job knows. We should celebrate the reward of Christ. And at the end, I'll just say that that's your greatest reward. I gave you some ancillary benefits of that reward. New body, new earth, eternal treasures. 
But the greatest reward that you will have is more of Jesus Christ. You'll have more of him. Your eyes will get more of a vision. Your heart will get more of his love. Your spirit will enjoy more of his relationship with you. You'll have Jesus Christ. That's your reward. And that ought to fill us with joy. That ought to lead us to obedience. That ought to keep our eyes focused on things that are eternal. And that leads us to our conclusion as we sum all this up. I'm going to be summing up this particular passage, but also this entire series. In one sentence, here's what I want to say. Your real reward of a resurrected eternity is already a spiritual reality and soon will become a physical reality. Your real reward of a resurrected eternity is already a spiritual reality and soon will become a physical reality. So I'll close by saying that we live in a a time that theologians call the already and the not yet. Okay, if you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ and you've been saved and you've received the Holy Spirit, as they say, you are blood-bought and spirit-filled, guess what that means? You live in the already and the not yet. What's the already? You're saved. You're sealed in the Holy Spirit. You have received by grace through faith the gift of salvation. You didn't earn it. You can't repay it. You can't lose it. That's the already. And we're working out that already with fear and trembling is what Paul says. We're working out that salvation, okay? The inward reality is starting to transform us outwardly in who we are, bearing the fruit of the Spirit. But we live in the not yet. There are promises of Scripture that a lot of the prosperity gospel preachers will tell you you can have right now if you just have enough faith and you name it and claim it. But guess what? You can't give people all the promises of heaven while they're here on earth because earth is temporary. We we couldn't enjoy them for eternity. But the new heavens and new earth, that's eternal. So we live in the not yet. You don't have a new body yet. You don't. You can look in the mirror and see clearly you do not have a new body yet, but it's coming. You don't live on a new earth yet. You don't believe me? Watch the news. There's death and disease and corruption and divisiveness and political turmoil, and all kinds of issues in the world today. This is not heaven on earth, but it's coming. It's coming. And so I just have to ask, do you let the not yet bring you more joy in the already? Because I don't think we think about the not yet aspect of our salvation. I just don't. I think we look at it like a, like a life insurance policy. Well, I took care of the paperwork in case something happens, we're set. Now I can go on living my life and just not worry about that. Well, in some aspect, yes. We would say that because you are saved by grace through faith, can't earn it, can't lose it, there should be a joy where you no longer fear condemnation. Romans 8, 1. There is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's a good thing. But, but the joy of your salvation that Paul, or excuse me, King David prays for after he confesses his sin in Psalm 51, restore to us the joy of our salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. Guess where that joy comes from? It comes from meditating on the not yet. It comes from meditating on all the rewards that lie ahead for us. And I, I plead with you today, I plead with you today, refocus on the not yet. Refocus on the not yet. We're just not focused enough on that, and that's the reason why we are the way that we are today. And so let me close out this message and this series by giving you one final recap of everything we've talked about in Philippians 3 and asking you to examine your own heart. So what about your real identity? Is your real identity Christ? Or is it still you? What you have and what you do? What about your real calling? Is it down here or is it really up there? What about your real home? Is it temporary earth or an eternal heaven? And what about your real reward? Is it earthly prosperity or eternal glory? 
Stop and think about that. Stop and think about what you're worried about right now. Stop and think about all that you're watching on the news right now and all that you're getting angry over right now and all the things that are having their way with you in your soul. And how much of that is due to the fact that you simply are not focused where God wants you to be focused. I I leave you with a couple of words. First, I want to motivate you with the words of Colossians 3, verses 2 through 4. Paul says, again, I mentioned this earlier in the series, set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. If you're going to refocus, you've got to set your mind on things above, not things that are here on the earth. You don't turn a blind eye to them, but you don't obsess over them. You see them in, in light of everything that's promised for all of eternity. And if you do that, there's rewards that lie ahead. And if you don't, well, guess what? On the day of judgment, God's going to clearly reveal what your focus was really on while you were here. And I'll conclude with an image. So the great George Whitfield, uh, probably the greatest evangelist before Billy Graham that uh, ever put, stepped foot on American soil. He was a, a Brit, but he spent a great time leading revival here in the United States of America several centuries ago. When George Whitfield died, people just proclaimed what a great man he was, but he, he demanded that when he died, they put a certain epitaph, certain phrase on his gravestone. And here's, here's what the gravestone says to this very day. I think he's buried in New England. You can read these words if you ever go to his graveside. It says, here lies George Whitfield. What sort of man he was, the great day will discover. What sort of man he was, the great day will discover. Well, I say the same for all of you. What kind of person you are, what your real focus is on, it's going to be revealed at judgment. If you say that you're a Christian, but you're obsessed with the things of the world, you're angry and bitter and divisive and stressed out and anxious over all these earthly things, and you say that you believe in the things that lie ahead, but you found no joy in them, you spent no time focusing on them, you in no way allow that to to guide how you make your decisions here on earth, well, that's going to reveal what type of Christian you really are at the day of judgment. And so I plead with you as we conclude this series, this is not some pie-in-the-sky metaphor to give you a feel-good on your way out the door. No, I'm being tangible. Every day, when you're in the shower in the morning, when you lie down at night, in those moments in between, you've got to see everything that we're experiencing now in light of what's to come in eternity. And so I call you. On behalf of the Word of God in Philippians chapter 3 and in many other verses we've talked about throughout this series, it's time to refocus. It's time to refocus on your real identity. It's time to refocus on your real calling. It's time to refocus on your real home. And it's time to refocus on your real reward. And as we draw to a close, I ask those of you tuning in, do you know that you know that you know that your life has been surrendered to the lordship of jesus christ that you know him that you've surrendered to him and that you are obeying him in all known areas of your life right now because if you don't i call you on the word of god to repent and believe on christ Repent and believe on Christ. Surrender your life to Him. And if you are living in sin right now, I call you to repent and resurrender your life to Christ. This is a time for us to refocus, to get our eyes on the things above, to be rejoicing and renewed in the promises that lie ahead. But those promises are not for you if Christ is not your Lord and Savior. I plead with you to give your life to Him today. And if so, you will know the real reward that lies ahead. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I think a person on this side of heaven could go crazy 
if we did not know the best is yet to come. We could go crazy in our bodies if we didn't know we'd get a new body. We could go crazy on this earth if we didn't know that we'd be able to live on a new earth. And we would go crazy if we had eternity without you. But we do know that we will have eternity with you in Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that according to the power of your Holy Spirit, you would truly help us to refocus. To refocus. Help us to refocus on our identity in Christ and our calling, which is upward, and our home, which is heavenward, and our reward, which is a new kingdom in a new body with our eternal Savior. Lord, for anyone listening to the sound of my voice, I just pray that you'd help calm their anxieties and renew the joy of their salvation, that they'd be refocused on things above. Help us as we continue in the days ahead. Keep our eyes on Christ and Christ alone. It's in his name we pray and all of God's people everywhere said, amen. Amen.